So, let me refresh your memory with one of the most frustrating, obnoxious, yet glorious, inspiring, and promising sounds of the 90s. Are you ready? Yes? Yeah. <laughs> It's getting wild. <laughs> Some of you remember or associate this sound with a brand new world that was opening up in front of you, full of new opportunities. It was a world that patience was really important. <laughs> Back in the day, Downloading a web page and surfing online was so slow that it gave us enough time to prepare a snack, to go to the bathroom, to enjoy a cigarette, or even start reading a book. I remember when downloading a page, I was di digesting every pixel as it slowly <laughs> appeared on my screen. The logos, the banners, the pictures, the, the pictures that took forever. <laughs> I remember my excitement and anticipation when coming back to my laptop and having the page completely load on my screen. <laughs> I was consuming every inch of it. And what about videos? Oh, I remember pressing the play button to watch a video, getting dressed, going out with my friends, and went back late that night, I still had to wait some time to watch it. Great times, huh? That was a world where time seemed more plentiful than the world that we live in today. And surfing online was a real adventure which required a lot of patience. Today, my problem is not the download speed or what to fit in my schedule while surfing. When life and information became so fast, The problem that we are all facing is how to filter the vast amount of information that is out there and make the right decisions about who to trust, to, to follow, and what are the most trustworthy sources to follow. And there are so many opinions, comments, and choices available that there, out there uh, that sometimes today you forget to speak with your friends you forget to eat, to enjoy simple and everyday pleasures. When you produce content and for an audience, this abundance and speed of information is a big challenge. And have you ever noticed what is the first thing that you touch when you wake up? Any ideas? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, for those who require assistance to wake up, like I do, because I'm not a morning person, uh, the first thing that we put our hands on when we wake up used to be a traditional alarm clock. However, an increasing amount of people, maybe the majority, the first thing that we touch when we wake up, if it's not your boyfriend or your girlfriend's leg, uh, <laughs> it's a, ce a cell phone. And there is a high probability that before you even get out of bed, you will start consuming a digital breakfast. <laughs> a breakfast which consists of reading your emails, sharing something on Facebook, reading news, uh, news feeds, stock markets, or even start tweeting. And you know what? <laughs> That's my life today. My personal and professional life is online. My digital and real-life personalities have been merged. Imagine that some of my friends, maybe all of them, they have stopped calling me Costas. I'm Yadzer, even for them. Every day, I'm trying to seek the best content I can in the, I can in, in the creative world. I read I receive, read, and reply to many emails. I talk to my contributors, and I'm doing my best 
to manage what I consume for myself and for others. Every day, every day I survive this information overload, and I try to beat this info beast. <laughs> I've always been curious in my life. I've always tried to absorb as much information as possible. From an early age, I was obsessed with the possibilities of digital life and the opportunities that it had to offer. For me, it was a window to all my passions and desires. Even when life was really slow and easy to digest, I faced a lot of dilemmas on how to process information and make the right decisions. And we all, we all reach a point in our life that we have to make a decision for our future, for what career path to follow. When I was in high school, my mind was full of ideas, ambitions, recommendations, and I was overwhelmed even back then by this info beast. And the advice that my friends and family gave me was to follow the path of stability and safety. So I was good at physics, and it seemed like a good idea to study it. Safe. However, I was always passionate about design. And that's what I did. I got into the university, the physics department of the University of Athens in 2000. And it took me <laughs> two years into the university to realize that thermodynamics and predicting the weather, because I was studying meteorology, was not me. So, I got a job, and I put myself through a designer school, and I started to filtering through all the information around me in order to pursue my true calling. And as you already know, your dream job does not exist. You must create it. So I started working for a Greek interior design magazine and planning my next moves. And it felt like I was taming this beast. And then I got drafted in the army. And suddenly, all my goals and all my passions were put on hold. I, was, I missed the beast, and I was so afraid that all my sacrifices, all the work that I had done, would go to waste. I was cut off and starved for both the information world and the ability to share it. And during this dry period of my life, there was a lyric from a song stuck in my head. Love is to share, love is to share, love is to share. By the way, it's from Sebastian Tellier, La Ritournelle. I don't want to sing it now. <laughs> and I said, I was so in love with design, and it seemed like that was what I was going to share. And my motto became, design is to share, and that's my motto ever since. So the internet world showed me the way. I started slowly to blogging in my time off in order to keep myself in tune and in touch with a world that was no longer easily accessible to me. And blogging is like cooking. I love cooking, and I love inviting my friends and offer them a good meal. I choose a tried and tested recipe and I gather the best ingredients, I add the correct spices, and I do my best to cook something delicious for my friends. However, that's exactly what bloggers do as well. And in order to become a good blogger, you have to maintain and offer the best, most delicious, most unique and freshest news you can. And that's not easy when you have to face this info beast day in and day out, because month by month it becomes bigger and bigger with more and more information and speed. Plus, there are other cooks out there who offer more elaborate meals faster and in a bigger quantity. 
It's not an easy job. When you produce and sell content, you are defined by it. Even if, so what you have to do is to find the most suitable data and make it yours, because we are what we tweet. What we choose to share defines who we are, even if it's not our creation, even if it's not our project, even if it's not our inspiration. It shows who we are. And when you share content with an audience, that's your only connection to it. And if you get it wrong or do not find the appropriate material, the lifespan of your blog will be short. And all you have to strive for is to maintain the appetite of your audience. Because slowly, day by day, you build a close relationship with them, which through time can turn into trust. So, how do you do that? How do you become a digital breakfast, lunch or dinner for someone when there are so many choices out there? My recipe is, in order to build trust, you have to be very selective. You should never lower your standards. You should always seek for quality, and you should always take responsibility for what you produce. But most of all, you have to be honest. You have to be true to yourself, to your audience, and to your vision. The trust of your followers is the only way to maintain their appetite for more. Even if the menu you have served a particular day, it's not the best you have served. The trust of your followers is like a drug that keeps you awake and obsessed to find the best you can in order to combat this information overload for them. And the trust by your followers is a gift that you have to deserve, that you have to be thankful for, and you should deserve it day in and day out. And this summer, I was reminded how special and unique and how rewarding this trust is, because in 2011, I created a Pinterest account, uh, a Pinterest account, and I had never used it before since this August, which means that one and a half year it was inactive. And uh, when I, after the big bang of Pinterest this summer, I said, "Okay, you have a, an account, so let's see what's going on there." So I logged in, and I realized that 5,000 people were following an empty profile. An inactive account with my name. And I said, in my opinion, that is called unconditional trust. And I did my best. I started pinning in order to show my, gra my gratitude to this trust. Because, and, and now, uh, imagine that I have more than 2.2 million followers on Pinterest. And that, for me, is a beautiful example that when you build trust, trust follows you. Throughout my digital life, I have appreciated the work of many designers, architects, artists, photographers, creative people. And it's a blessing that my selections have been appreciated by more people than only me. And in the digital world, when you build and maintain the trust and the appetite of millions, this is interpreted as success. So all you have to do is to build trust, and they will click. And I thought that this was an idea worth spreading. Thank you.